I'm Thomas L. Jeffers, Tom Jeffers, um, literary critic, literary historian, um, currently working at Marquette University, which is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, but prior to that, um, I did a PhD at Yale University and began teaching at Cornell. <clears throat> Spent a year at Harvard uh, and then went uh, to Marquette, where I've been for a couple decades. Um, I'm a literature teacher trained in literary studies. And that meant that when I first began to work on Norman Podhoretz, uh, who began himself as a literary critic, I knew my way around, at least in that particular area of his many interests. He's from a uh, family that had come to America in the years just after World War I. And they were from the Ukraine, from Galicia, the darkest Galicia. And you know, they spoke Yiddish at home. And everybody else in Brooklyn, where their neighborhood was, uh, who was Jewish, that was most of them, uh, spoke Yiddish at home for the American-born generation, which would have included Norman, born in 1930. <clears throat> uh, English was a sort of second language. And uh, these kids had to master the new tongue in a way that would enable them to you know, get a job, just sort of get along in the new world. He became, he had to become a fighter. Uh, you had to be able to face down a challenge on the streets. Otherwise, you were instantly nobody, instantly annihilated. Was he readily confesses he probably never actually won a fight. He never backed away from a fight. And I think that um, personality trait, like he's scared, but he's not going to run away, uh, was very good training for the life he was later to lead in the world of New York intellectuals. Because those guys are fighters. You know, there's, in any given room, there's one guy who's going to be declared the smartest, who's going to be declared the winner, who's going to uh, triumph in whatever debate's going on. He was a commentary reader from way, bit, <clears throat> way back at the beginning. Uh, commentary was a magazine sponsored by and begun by the American Jewish Committee in 1945. And Norman wrote for them right after he got home from Cambridge. And occasionally, while he was in the Army, he submitted pieces. And then from 55 to 60, as I say, he was writing for lots of magazines, The New Yorker and, and Partisan Review, but also commentary. And again, he was such a star that in 1960, at the age of 30, commentary made him editor. He was like the youngest editor ever. Um, and he took the magazine to the left. He told them that's what he was going to do, um, meaning that it would emphasize a kind of you know way left of center political agenda and a cultural agenda that was open to new ideas in education and in the arts and um, in, in literature. So that names like Norman O'Brown, Norman Mailer, um, Paul Goodman, names at that time to conjure with, if you're trying to think of you know, what the cutting edge ideas were on the left, Podhoretz sponsored all those writers and was friends with them. Pot horse is important because reason <clears throat> maybe least important here, but still has to be mentioned. For 35 years, he edited Commentary Magazine, and Commentary Magazine was the voice of Jewish intellectualism, you know, from 1945 until today. Um, but that's too vague. In the 60s, it was identified with the New Left, as I was saying before. And then in the 70s and on into the 80s and since, um, it became identified with neoconservatism, a kind of corrective move uh, in answer to the New Left. And all this <clears throat> was the work of Norman and his stable of writers.
Secondly, um, he himself has been a marvelous writer. He puts the right words in the right order. And this plot, uh, the um, tale that he has to tell when he's in the autobiographical mode is that young man from the provinces story, uh, which in a way is the story of um, the kind of realization of or the fulfillment of the American dream. And why should any kid, you know, 25 or 35 years old, have an interest in the story of this old guy, he's just now 80 years old, uh, who was a young man from the provinces in the late 1940s and through the 1950s. Uh, for the same reason, you might want to read Charles Dickens's uh, Great Expectations or Stendhal's The Red and the Black about a kid from nowhere, uh, the provinces, who comes to the Metropolitan Center and, you know, by dint of his own talents, sometimes even his own brilliance, uh, succeeds and also screws up. And the screwing up is central to any story like this. Nobody knows how to do everything right from the get-go. You learn by making mistakes. The book is put together of <clears throat> uh, pieces from three different sources, so to speak. There's the literary record, what he's published, and it's quite voluminous, a dozen books and just really hundreds of articles. Um, and they in themselves are of Fascinating interest, but added to that are two things, an, a series of uh, oral histories, you know, hours of talking to Pod Horitz himself, to his wife, to his children, and to 35 or 40 people who, to a greater or lesser degree of intimacy, have known him uh, personally and professionally over the last 30 or 40 years. And, you know, and it's one thing to talk to somebody, you, you have a transcript written up from the tape <clears throat> that you've made, and then you've got to read the transcript and figure out you know, what there is merely replicative of things you've heard from other people and what is uh, unique and irreplaceable. Um, that becomes a new text, if you will, um, your transcript from all these oral histories. And then finally, and probably this is what most historians are used to, but it was new to me and exciting, is the archival record, uh, Norman's papers, which are at the Library of Congress in Washington, consisting largely of letters and you know, clippings from newspapers and so forth, which he set aside, manuscripts and things that he's written uh, and not published, um, and occasionally letters uh, written to him by, by other people. Um, and then, almost as rich, the archives of Commentary Magazine. And I, I kid you not, there, uh, think of this floor to ceiling with, with notebooks, and there are about three times this much in the way of letters from 1960 to the late 90s.